We are excited you are joining us for another inspirational and educational episode of Concord Conversations. Concord Conversations is an initiative by Concord Medical Group to educate, empower, and encourage our community about our health so we can all live to our fullest potential. Did you know that lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related death in both men and women? Today's episode is Knocking the Wind Out of Lung Cancer, a discussion about lung cancer screening. We are discussing how we can change the outcome and improve people's lives with early detection. Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Weinberg, Director of the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program at Concord Medical Group, Northwell Health. We are joined by our outstanding colleagues from Lenox Hill Hospital, Northwell Health, and faculty of the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University. I would like to introduce you all to the Director of Lung Cancer Screening at the Lung Institute of Northwell Health, Dr. Brett Beatty, and Chief of Thoracic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, Dr. Sobroto Paul. Many of our Concord community have submitted fascinating questions to ask our experts today. We only have 30 minutes together, so we're gonna go through as many as we can. Remember, we are giving general guidance. If you have a particular question about your health, we'd like to help you. So come in and talk to our exceptional Northwell physicians so we can answer your questions and give your health the attention it deserves. Let's get started. Thank you both for joining us. So Dr. Paul, what is lung cancer screening? So lung cancer screening is a test, just like a mammogram or a colonoscopy that uh, patients undergo, people undergo who are at high risk of lung cancer. It involves a discussion with your physician or a lung cancer screening group, and it's followed by a quick 30-second CAT scan that takes uh, detailed images of your lungs to see if there's anything worrisome in your lungs. First of all, thank you for the opportunity. And let me remind everyone that November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. I've got a white ribbon here, so I hope everybody, if you see that, you recognize what it means. What I'll add to what uh, Dr. Paul said was uh, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in the U.S., so a really big deal for us to prioritize we do best at helping people live longest with lung cancer when we find it early. And unless we're looking for it, we tend to find lung cancer in the more advanced stages. So that highlights why we're here talking today. A study published just this week demonstrated that only 6% of eligible Americans have lung cancer screening. Why is screening so important? Uh, the numbers are pretty staggering in that we know that lung cancer screening can improve your chance of dying from lung cancer by 15 to 20%. Lung cancer screening recommendation has been out since 2013, so yet only 6% of the eligible patients are, are, are pursuing it. So we need to do a better job of getting the word out and uh, uh, making people aware that our screening program exists and is really helpful. Dr. Paul, what thoughts? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a lung cancer screening is a life-saving measure. You know, it, it provides a survival benefit of at least 15 to 20% for people who are smokers by catching lung cancer early. And, uh, you know, I think we, it's our job as physicians and the medical community to let our, our community know that this test exists. It's safe, it's effective, and it's available, and it's provided by your insurance. Um, so we're here to spread the word uh, about lung cancer screening and lung cancer awareness. And it's a, like, it, just like people get mammograms and people get uh, skin checks for melanoma and people get colonoscopies, this is another test just to help improve your life and, and catch lung cancer early if you are at risk. Who is at risk for lung cancer? The question that comes up a lot in clinic is, is who's eligible for lung cancer screening? And there, there's four big um, numbers that I'd throw at you. The first is uh, the, the biggest risk factors, as a lot of people know, are, for lung cancer are, are age and, and history of tobacco smoking. So kind of expectedly, the indications are age. Um, most insurances now cover lung cancer between age 50 and 80. Uh, the amount you've smoked, and we use kind of a, a fancy doctor term called pack years. That is the number of packs per day that you smoked on average and the number of years that you smoked. And you multiply those two together. And if it's greater than 20, then that tells us that you might be at increased risk of lung cancer and would be eligible for screening. Uh, the third is if you are either still smoking or quit within the last 15 years. And the final is not a number, but if you're asymptomatic, because if you're having symptoms like cough, shortness of breath that are new, we might still get a scan, but we might be looking for something else like infection or the reason why you're feeling bad. Dr. Paul, would you add more? So I would add a little bit to that. I think it's a, really a discussion. Those are the hard and fast criteria that, you know, that the guidelines and societies give. But it's really a discussion with your primary care doctor 
about what your risk, individualized risk factors are. It could be that you had a radiation exposure as a child because you're treated for a lymphoma. It could be you had breast radiation many, many years ago uh, for treatment of breast cancer, or you got exposed working at the World Trade Center, or you got exposed to asbestos or something during a, a job that you have. Um, so there are other risk factors like radon in your home. And if you have those risk factors, um, you, know, you, you discuss it with your doctor and it may not be a hard and fast rule, but uh, they can get a lung cancer screening test approved for you and you can get a CAT scan at that point. And many insurances cover the CAT scan. Dr. Paul, is a chest x-ray a good screening tool for lung cancer? A chest x-ray to me is like looking at uh, the globe and you know saying, okay, here is, is Estonia. And you're like, okay, how do I get there? And it's, it's not that very detailed. It just gives you a kind of a, a, you know, a global picture to be, you know, of what things are. Uh, a CAT scan to me is like using Google Maps or Waze. It gives you a detailed roadmap as to where you're going. And that's what a CAT scan is. It gives you a detailed picture, shows you all, it, all you know, you know, not only your lungs, but your heart, your blood vessels, your thyroid. And it's a very detailed imaging of what you have. And oftentimes things that are missed on an X-ray you can see on a CAT scan and all the studies that have proven lung cancer screening to be effective use a, a low dose CAT scan and they kind of compared it already to x-rays and that's why a CAT scan is so much better. Many people ask about that, am I not gonna be glowing in the dark because I'm getting all these CAT, CAT scans? You're gonna, doc, you wanna radiate me? Come on. Uh, but the CAT scans that we do now are, you know, are low dose, you know, they're not much more than an x-ray and if, your doctor thinks that you're going to benefit from it because they're going to catch a lung cancer early, it's definitely worth it. If I could add my two cents. First of all, I totally agree. I really like the analogy of Google Maps versus a, another map. But I would say to, to dive a little deeper into the, into the science, it, there was a big study about 10 years ago that, that compared chest x-ray to low-dose CT. Uh, and the low dose CT was the, was the study that won out. And it kind of makes sense in that we'll, we'll talk in a moment about a, a spot on your lung, a lung nodule. And those are really small spots that we're looking for. And a, a low dose CT, the Google Maps of imaging, is, is much better identifying those smaller spots in the chest x ray. Are there side effects to a yearly CAT scan for lung cancer screening? Yeah, I think that question gets at um, the, the risk benefit that you'll talk about with your doctor. I, I think the risk we, or the benefit we already discussed and that what we want to do is find a cancer early so that we can treat it. Are there any risks associated? Dr. Paul alluded to one, which is radiation exposure. You, you might potentially be getting imaging for 20 or 30 years. That's the reason why we uh, try and give you the lowest dose that, you, that we need to see the pictures because radiation exposure increases your risk of lung and other cancers. Uh, the second is what we might see when we look on that CT scan. When we, when we do a scan like that, because we're doing the Google Maps version, we, we see you from the, the bottom of your neck to the top of your stomach. And we see more than your lungs. And sometimes we see things that we need to pursue that aren't cancer. Like look at your heart for a heart disease. Or look at your thyroid for nodules or some of the other organs. Uh, that's the second. The third is what we call false positives. Sorry for the doctor term but we find something that worries us that it might be a cancer or something that we need to pursue. And we either get another x-ray or another CT uh, or we actually go after it uh, with, a, with a biopsy to find out what it is and it might not be cancer. So I think those are the top three. Dr. Paul, would you add anything? Uh, I would add that, you know, these you know, Google Maps or these CTs are so uh, detailed and most of the studies that people who undergo the CTs, they find not only a benefit in, in detecting lung cancer, but they actually get what we call an absolute mortality benefit. I mean, the people that were enrolled in the uh, trials live longer, you know, 10% or more than people who, you know, were just getting an x-ray just because they found these other things that otherwise wouldn't have been found. And they found coronary disease, they found thyroid disease, and, uh, and you know, people got other life-saving interventions like coronary stents, like cardiac surgery, they got their valve fixed, they found thyroid cancer. Uh, so there are a lot of benefits and, you know, you know, any test can find things that sometimes are not going to be very, you know, specific to what you have, or it may lead you down the wrong road, 
But, you know, as physicians and particularly in any lung cancer screening program, there's a group of us and we make thoughtful decisions about what we're going to do. And, um, you know, your physician and us, we would never put you through something that we didn't think would be worth it for you. Dr. Paul, we all know that smoking is bad for you. How bad is it really? It's bad. It's super bad. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of my friends who are not obviously physicians ask me, so, um, you know, what can I do? Can I eat this steak? Can I, you know, uh, you know, can I like have this pie? Uh, I like pies. I like, you know, I'm, my favorite is key lime pie. And, you know, the answer to all these things are, uh, yes, I can have my pie in moderation. I can have a steak in moderation. However, you really can't smoke in moderation. It's not a good idea. It's not only increases your risk of lung cancer, but coronary artery disease, other cancers. Um, it destroys your lungs. So your lung function deteriorates over time and you can develop emphysema or COPD and wind up you know, needing a lung transplant. Uh, as a thoracic surgeon, uh, you know, I have seen all the consequences of smoking, you know, lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, needing a lung transplant. And it's just, you know, the answer is no. It's just bad for you. Just you got to quit. And it's easier said than done. And there's a lot of programs there to help you. And I think Dr. Beatty can kind of uh, go with that. Yeah, I was going to add three points. And we, as we, as we shift the table, I think Yoda agrees that, first of all, um, there's no safe amount of, of cigarette smoke. Uh, uh, to take that a step further, there's really nothing safe that should be in your lungs other than clean air. And we're learning more about that every day, whether it's secondhand smoke or environmental tobacco smoke, whether it's vaping, whether it's environmental pollution, there's risk to both your lungs and potentially the development of lung cancer to several of those. The second is tobacco smoke is the leading cause of preventable death in the US. And we talked about a lot of this already, but lung cancer is what we're focusing on today. Heart disease is another, lung disease is a third, strokes are a fourth, all the leading cause from, from tobacco smoking. So I agree with the first assessment. It's really bad. It's just bad. Yeah. As to the as to what we can do about it, there's a lot. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a really difficult problem. Um, and quitting smoking can be harder than, than quitting a lot of hard drugs. Uh, and a lot of people get down if the first time they try, they aren't successful. And what I would tell everyone is that's really common, is a lot of people aren't able to quit the first time. That shouldn't dissuade you from trying uh, in the future. Uh, in our clinic, the things that we focus on are, are one, a lot of people know about a cold turkey method that is, can I just do it on my own? For sure, some people are able, but we find that that's less likely to be successful. There are several medications that we could, we could talk about with you, which might be replacing nicotine, which has a lot of different forms. There are some pills, some of them that you might have seen on television, like bupropion or varenicline. And we even have a clinic that focuses just on tobacco cessation for you. Uh, and that's kind of embedded in our lung cancer screening program at Northwell. So a lot of options. And you're not quitting for yourself, you're quitting for your family as well. Yes. Is it too late to quit if you've been smoking 20 or 30 years? Will there be a benefit? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Quitting will basically, you know, as soon as you, as soon as you quit your body, the, the changes in your body that happen not only at like the cellular level, but at the genetic level, your risks of cancer go down, your heart disease go on, and the further away you are from smoking, the longer those, you know, the more of those benefits happen. Uh, so, you know, quitting at any moment, at any time is beneficial for you. It's never too late to quit. The, I, I'd add to that. First of all, I totally agree. Second of all, this comes up in, in my clinic. I'm a lung doctor a lot. Is that, well, some people think, well, the damage is already done. Uh, I might as well continue. And, and I, I disagree with that. I know it's really, really hard to quit, but there is no bad time to quit smoking in that reduces your risk of lung and other cancers. It protects your lung function. Uh, it improves your breathing over the course of time after you get out more mucus. Uh, and even in people who already have cancer, there's benefit in that they're able to tolerate their treatment better and even probably live longer. So there's really no time, even though it's really, really hard to, to, to not quit. Some patients are diagnosed with lung cancer who never smoked. What are other risk factors for lung cancer besides smoking? And we highlighted those before, and I wanna to add to our list because that's a really important question in that we talked a lot about cessation of smoking and smoking being your single biggest risk factor for lung cancer. But as we see, uh, even outside of people who smoked, lung cancer is a big deal. Even in and of itself, it's a big 
a big cause of lung cancer. We tend to see it more frequently in women and, and specifically Asian women. And so it highlights some of the risk factors. We already talked about other exposures besides um, tobacco smoke. One is radon, which is kind of a, a colorless silent gas that sometimes are, are in our basements or, uh, or underground. Uh, occupationally, uh, asbestos, something you might've worked around. Uh, family history, that is even if you were a never smoker, if someone in your family had lung cancer, you're still at increased risk. And some of those genetic um, uh, deviations that I talked about that we tend to see more commonly in patients who are Asian and patients who are women. Uh, Dr. Paul? So I think this kind of highlights why it's a, a important to have a discussion with your doctor. So if you never smoke, but you have some risk factors, uh, a good solid discussion of the risk factors with your physician can lead to you being screened for lung cancer. Uh, currently, we do it by CT, but our scientists are at Northwell at Cold Spring Harbor are working on other means of uh, trying to establish lung cancer without a CAT scan and future variations of lung cancer screening may just be a blood test. And they're not in, they're not in practice now, but that doesn't mean they won't be in the next five to 10 years. Okay, there's a question in the chat box. How often should I get a lung CT scan? The recommendation is if you meet the criteria or you've had this discussion with your doctor and we've decided to pursue screening, the recommendation is between ages 50 and 80. In general, if we look at the scan, the way the system works is you get the scan and then we look at it with a radiologist and whoever your reading doctor is, whether it's a lung doctor or a surgeon or a primary care doctor, uh, and we decide if there's anything concerning on there. If we don't see anything that concerns us, in general, we, we recommend repeating the scan in a year, so annually while you meet the criteria. In some patients, we see spots that worry us and we wanna keep a little closer eye on it. Most commonly, we would repeat the scan a little bit earlier than we would otherwise, say at three or six months. But overall, in most cases, we recommend follow-up in a year until you meet one of those criteria where we probably wouldn't pursue screening anymore. Let's talk a little bit about what we can see on the CT scan. So what is a lung nodule? How can you tell if it's cancerous? So a lung nodule is a spot in your lung. So when we take that kind of Google Maps picture and I get a detailed look at your lungs, um, we see a spot. Now, what could that spot be? Um, it could be a whole variety of things. First, it could be something infectious. You know, you got a cold or you got a, a pneumonia and a odd little pneumonia, have a little infection over there. It could be some inflammation. You went through and, or inhaled something and it created some kind of riled up something in your lung and you got a little inflammatory spot. It could be some old infection that caused some scarring in your lung. Uh, so there are all these benign things that it can be. And most of the things that we find when we do lung cancer screening are benign. However, in some cases, um, these small spots can grow or they're, or they're larger spots and they could potentially be a cancer. And if we think that it's a cancer, we do some additional testing. Sometimes we get something what meant some, some of your friends may have had or heard about, and they call it PET scan. And sometimes based on those results and the results of the CAT scan, we decide to do a biopsy or, or take a portion of a little piece or a sample of the nodule to get an idea of what it is. Where would you and add something yeah, up, Beatty? I, I, I love the description and that we discuss, discuss this a lot in clinic again. And, and the reason it comes up a lot, and I'd like to convey it to everyone that in the people who are getting CT scans, low dose CT scans, or someone in your family is, it's really common that we see one of these nodules or one of these lung spots. And it can be pretty scary. And that if we look at a scan in and of itself, we can't distinguish in a lot of cases what is one of those benign scars from maybe you had pneumonia as a kid. Maybe you were exposed to something that your lungs got inflamed and that spot's there forever, but that's not cancer. In that big study that I mentioned about 10 years ago that kind of described how we looked at lung cancer screening, about one in four patients had some of those spots, almost all of which, 90% or higher, were not lung cancer. So I want everybody to know that whether it's inside or outside your lungs, it's relatively frequent that if you get a scan, we're going to find something. It kind of highlights how important it is to, to talk to it with your doctor before you get too um, anxious because a lot of those spots are not going to be cancer. Would you like to discuss a little bit more about a lung biopsy, Dr. Paul? How are they performed? So there's a variety of ways that we can do it. Uh, some of them are done by CT guidance, where you're essentially in the CAT scan machine and with a little bit of local anesthesia, they kind of uh, interventional radiologist typically stick a little needle and take a little sample of the cells from the nodule. Uh, so that's one way. Another way is our 
uh, pulmonology colleagues or interventional pulmonology colleagues use a bronchoscope, which is similar to a colonoscope or an, e or an endoscope where they basically go into your airways and kind of travel out all the way out to where the nodule is and stick a needle in there and get an answer. Um, now we have this uh, robotic technology to do it, where we have a robotic arm essentially that uh, basically gets put into your airways and then we guide the robot using, um, you know, essentially the same guidance system that is in the MX missile and the nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles that we have, just in the miniaturizable version of it uh, on the table in the uh, endoscopy suite that we kind of use to help guide us there along with CAT scans and these navigation methods. We call it navigational bronchoscopy uh, with the robot, but literally that's where the technology was initially developed to launch a nuclear missile and get it to a spot. But that's exactly what we're doing for lung cancer. We're targeting a nuclear missile at it to get an answer out of it. So that's typically how we do it. Sometimes those methods don't give us an answer. 80% of the times they do, 20% they can't. And if in th those circumstances, we sometimes recommend surgery. And surgery, you, usually we do robotically, again, do a couple of small incisions with a little camera and robotic wristed instruments that kind of mimic my hands like this. And we go in there and we take a portion of the lung with the nodule and we figure out uh, once it's out, whether the pathologist will tell us if it's cancer or not. And that's kind of the more definitive way if we can't get, a, get an answer by uh, with a needle or by a needle either through a CT guidance or a bronchoscope. So we have a lot of different ways of doing it. The mechanisms I totally agree with and what Dr. Paul alluded to is at Northwell and elsewhere, we really focus on the least invasive method to get the answer to our question. Oftentimes the question is, what is this spot? And we have several different ways to get to it. The way we choose is the, is the one that's the least invasive and the safest for you. And that's kind of an individualized decision for everyone. The second, and Dr. Paul alluded to this before, is that the way the field is moving is, is more towards less invasiveness. We're starting to do studies looking at blood to try and see if we can get markers with a simple blood draw. We're not quite there yet, but the field is moving towards less and less invasiveness, which is in strong contrast to, to the way you might have approached this 20 or 30 years ago. I was going to say less is more, more or less. Yes, so the technology is really exciting in the field. So can you discuss a little bit about treatment options if you are diagnosed with lung cancer? Is there hope if you're diagnosed? You know, if you're diagnosed with lung cancer early, and usually it's surgery, and uh, surgery for early stage lung cancers in some cases can even lead to a 100% cure um, and if it's really, really early. So the earlier you get diagnosed, the earlier you get treatment, the better you're going to be. Uh, I would say you know, I, I've been doing this for a while. And when I first started, if you got diagnosed with advanced stage lung cancer, stuff that we could not operate it on, or patients had surgery and they recurred, um, it wasn't very good. They didn't have a lot of options. But our scientists uh, here and elsewhere have been coming up with all sorts of therapies. Uh, some of them are kind of what we call targeted therapies against specific mutations in the tumor, and others are immunotherapies, activating your own immune system to attack the tumor. And what I've seen is like many of my patients, even if they have metastatic disease, are living five years, 10 years. When one drug doesn't work, they get another drug. Then that drug doesn't work, scientists come up and the FDA approves another drug. So we see something almost every other, I would say every other month, a new drug or new indication for the for uh, either a targeted therapy or immunotherapy for lung cancer. Um, so it's obviously not good to get lung cancer, but it's better to have it now than say 20 years ago because you have a lot more options to treat it. And our goal is to either cure it or just or to make it a chronic disease that you live a lot, live with it until something, you know, until the planet explodes. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, but I, I'll let Dr. Beatty comment. Yeah. There are a lot of stereotypes associated with lung cancer. One of those is often that if you get it, well, I don't have a lot of options and, and the universe is bad. And that's no longer true. The, 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 the surgeries are getting better. The radiation, if you need it, is getting better. And what Dr. Paul said is the drugs are getting better and more numerous. Whereas previously there might've been one, it's kind of what we call cytotoxic chemo. It kind of uh, one that a lot of people reference, it makes you tired, your hair might fall out. And that's not the only option these days. Targeted therapies, which can be in the form of pills. Uh, immunotherapy, which uses your own body. To, to kill a cancer inside. It, it, it's a different field than I think what a lot of people are aware of. 
there's a couple questions in the chat box that I think are interesting. One is other than shortness of breath and a cough, what are the symptoms of lung cancer? Shortness of breath and cough are both important ones. The one I'd add about cough is that sometimes people who either have smoke or used to smoke, they, they cough a lot. So what really gets my attention, if, if you point out, is the cough has changed somehow. That is, you have a new cough where the cough gets either more intense or even more specifically if there's blood in it. So the, the couple of answers to that question is most commonly uh, a new lung cancer would present with shortness of breath, that is the airways impacted, a cough, cough that's different or producing blood, or if you're losing weight unexpectedly. Um, so what I'll add is that unfortunately, the tumors that grow inside you, you can't feel and you can't see. And that's one of the problems with lung cancer, that if it grows and you develop symptoms, you're really getting at an advanced stage. So the idea of lung cancer screening is to really catch it early uh, so that we can treat it with surgery or some minimally invasive mean that you can live longer. And you know, the, the, so a lot of patients are asymptomatic. They just, you know, they, they don't have any, they don't feel anything and they just happen to get it caught on different CAT scans. That's why it's so important that if you meet the criteria for lung cancer screening, uh, the strict criteria set up by the different societies, or you have an individual discussion with your doctor and you have other risk factors that require you to get a study. It's so important to get it because you may not have any symptoms and before it's too late and we want to catch it early. Okay, there's a question in the chat box about 9-11. So does being exposed to toxins from 9-11 increase your risk of lung cancer? You know, we think the answer to that is yes. We kind of alluded to this before that there's really nothing healthy from an aerosol perspective that should go in your lungs besides air. The uh, exposure from 9-11 is a great example and the afterwards with all the ambient um, pollution, dust, smoke, uh, people both develop lung diseases and some of those lung, lung diseases are lung cancers. Uh, so even broader than 9-11 specifically, the secondary exposures are, are always worrisome. And the short answer to the question is we think yes. Last question. If you had one action step to recommend to our viewers to improve their health and start today, what would it be? I'll reiterate that I'm a lung doctor. And uh, the single biggest thing is if you're, if you're continuing to smoke, so let us try and help you work on it. And that if we can get your smoking down to zero, then we can protect your lungs, protect your heart. We can't reverse a lot, but we can make things a lot better. That'd be number one. So my number one thing would be, I would recommend getting screened. Um, lung cancer screening is just like getting a colonoscopy, getting a mammogram, getting your skin checked to see if you have a melanoma or suspicious mole. It, it's safe, it's effective. It um, not only protects you from lung cancer, death from lung cancer, but from other diseases as well. So get, if you're eligible, get screened, not only for yourself, but for your loved ones as well. You want to be around for everybody. Well, thank you all for joining us for another inspirational and educational episode of Concord Conversations. A very special thank you to Dr. Beatty and Dr. Paul for joining our conversation. We appreciate their expertise to educate, encourage, and empower our community. As part of the Concord community, we hope you will share in our mission. Please pass along our emails and webinar links to your friends and family. In addition, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We know you have additional questions about your health and we want to help you. So come in and speak with our extraordinary Northwell physicians about your health. We care about your health. We care about you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.